Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, talking to you about all the things that are happening in and around the city of Missoula and beyond. Um, I got some, I got a brand new uh, dubbing stuff, pre-critic, uh, events for your weekend, and more, but we're going to jump right in. And um, one of the big things that are happening this week, especially this week, it kind of seems like corporate uh, media is Try doing some uh, major changes by cutting people off like Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon. Perhaps he was too expensive after the settlement with uh, Dominion, after uh, Fox News lost about $787 million in a settlement, or they just wanted to get rid of him while since he was caught saying, we are very, very close to being able to ignore Trump most nights. I truly can't wait. A quote, by, uh, Tuck, uh, a quote by Tucker Carlson brought up by the investigation into the January 6th incident. So at this point, it's speculation that and uh, Tucker was famous for getting into debates with Jon Stewart and being owned to the point uh, his own show, Crossfire, was taking off from the air. And he worked for MSNBC for some time before he got in, at the cushy job at Fox News after the very popular Bill O'Reilly got me too out of there. During the Trump administration, Chuck Kirk became a voice for uh, right-leaning denizens of Americans and got a decent following taking populism as a form to connect with the disenfranchised Americans. So far, this is at the time where cable news is uh, losing viewership and money based on recent lawsuits. It came down to money, as Tucker may have been the face of Fox since 2017. It might have not been enough to get the eyes they need uh, at the price he costs. So Don Lemon, speaking of uh, on the other aisle, uh, CNN, uh, much more left-leaning news, is out as well this week. Uh, CNN, CNN primetime was Don's spot for the longest time, but after Discovery took over, they decided to do some cutting and rearranging of television personalities, and for Don, moving from night to morning was the beginning of the end for that particular person. So, you know, perhaps, you know, with the shrinking and sat, uh, saturated times, you know, there's a lot of uh, corporate entities basically buying up everything and starting to cut. A lot of people are getting cut here left and right for these kind of middle, middle upper class type jobs, six figure type income type stuff, or are, you know, in, in, in many ways, you know, you just never know. So cable news is kind of based on, um, you know, consumers, the people who subscribe to cable television because CNN, Fox News, all basically bundle in the same thing. So if you have cable news and you specifically watch CNN or Fox News, you're technically paying for one or the other. Um, oh, you're, you're one and the other, not one or the other. So that's this is kind of how the revenue works. But at the same time, they do also uh, take into account ad revenue sponsored by Pfizer and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, MCAD being a cable news company is also uh, within that realm of sphere but of course we're not as big a budget because we're more regional because there are regional sections kind of like how cities use SIDs to pay for sidewalks in specific areas but that's nowhere here nor there and that's just kind of how it is a lot of these uh, corporate media places not that many people's eyes are on screens you know everyone's competing you have uh, streaming services it seems like every day there seems to be a new thing that's uh, taking your eyes and putting them on screens so uh, Bed Bath & Beyond has gone bankrupt and many of their stores might close unless they get their buyer by June. The dead pandemic finally took their toll on their store as online buying became one of the more options for many for so long. It plans to begin closing 360 Bed Bath & Beyond stores. There's, I believe there's about 1,500 across the nation and uh, 120 Bye Bye Baby stores, which is a version of the Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, the turnover on both retail, uh, retail and uh, leadership levels never helps. But this is an ongoing story for many once powerhouse in their own ways, dealing with many faults and pitfalls from a business that once was a retail killer in their own rights. And the, and the cool thing about what Bed Bath & Beyond did is that they allowed managers of the Bed Bath & Beyonds in your local regional area to basically stock up based on you know, trends in the community. It was like, so one community might like this more than the other. And so they stock specific things that people want to see. So as seen t on TV isn't the same anymore and with the internet, and safe online shopping with near day, uh, next day delivery. Change came and, and in store shopping is getting more, more and more scarce, you know. DoorDash is the closest thing to uh, grocery shopping and if it 
trends like this continue, delivery will basically be the backbone of the American economy where we're all just basically delivering to one another. So, um, and you know, even that's in danger. You know, you might've heard about the other day about the Uber Eats driver who just got murdered and dismembered. So yeah, the word dismembered, it's just kind of a haunting detail of this uh, like ongoing story. And so the whole story is basically when an Uber Eats employee never came home, they checked out their last delivery and caught a Florida man, Oscar Solis Jr., who's 30, who has been released, who was released from prison back in January after four years with uh, assault and battery charges. Uh, officials claim that what had happened to the victim was demonic. So, oof. I don't really have a good segue for this next one, so let's just jump right in. President Joe Biden announced his bid for the 2024 election because one of the uh, mo um, because uh, a lot of times, you know, so he, he did it around uh, 4 a.m. on Tuesday this week and just kind of wanted to get it with the, uh, all the new fresh uh, morning no news cycles and that as well. But of course, when an incumbent tries to run, there are very few prospectives uh, and many uh, um, Democratic voters. And you see a lot of polls and a lot of people are just kind of like, he's a little bit old. I'm really weary about having Biden as president because of some of the baggage he's carrying on, hence Kamala. Uh, so. That's, it's a very small following for uh, other candidates who are trying to vie for the primaries. There's a little bit of blurb. Um, Marion Williamson, if you've heard of her, uh, she's made a name of herself for uh, breaking the rank and file Democratic norm, but ran on the uh, harness love for political purposes and also knew Oprah. So, you know, my mom would like her. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> My mom never trusts politicians. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. also announced his bid on going into, uh, um, after going into obscurity for speaking against the Iraq war back um, in the early days, 18 years ago. However, he is so anti-vax that he started a nonprofit about it. Montana will have blood on their hands, according to Missoula Representative Zoe Zephyr, as she spoke passionately on protesting trans and trans youth uh, as uh, Montana aims to ban gender-affirming care. Leaders of the GOP controlled a state's legislature on Monday continued denying uh, of Re Representative Zoe Zephyr the chance to speak during proceedings on Monday after protesters chanted her, let her speak, forced them to adjourn temporary uh, for the Tuesday. The lawmakers are demanding that she apologize for telling the colleagues, which she did not. Um, efforts to punish uh, Zephyr originated from the Freedom Caucus, whose members said Zephyr's comments displayed a hateful rhetoric and called for a commitment to civil discourse. Similar criticisms against Democrats were expelled from the Tennessee State House for joining in gun control demonstrations. Um, when we begin to punish our dissenters, we lose the ability to see a new perspective. And regardless of what she had to say, she deserves to say it as a rep for the state of Montana. Anyways, um, some of the time uh, the Tuesday session was canceled and the Montana legislature would either continue to censure or base in which just recent news this week as well is that Zoe was technically out and AP really uh, uh, hit it hard for sure. Uh, like a lot of views really kind of sparked up on my YouTube app just seeing all these uh, quotes and clips that they showed. Um, you know, she's still there. She's still uh, um, kind of trying to do her thing, but for the most part, she's not going to uh, be wrapping up the proceedings of this uh, legislative session. So the, uh, the, the bill in question is the Senate Bill 99, and it's uh, on track to being on the desk of Governor Gene Forte. And the bill draws a line between male and female genders with the biological sex to social behavior and re uh, referring to gender dysphoria as a mental illness in conjunction with the diagnosis uh, diagno diagnostic and st statistical manual of mental disorders, fifth edition. Also, the fact that they wanted to ban um, transitioning care for minors, regardless of parental consent. This might get turned over the Montana Supreme Court, maybe federal courts. Missoula ha officials have come out to support Zoe Zephyr in solidarity. So, speaking of Missoula, one of the big things that are happening in the city of Missoula is um, they're on track to buying Marshall Mountain. Of course, they had a whole, uh, they spent a couple hundred thousand dollars just so they can determine whether or not it's feasible. A master plan is going to be presented before they do it. And one of the bigger changes of the ticket price was originally $1.9 million is now been rounded up to about $2.4 million since uh, recent estimates. So Missoula Current reports that the open, oh, sorry, <coughs> open space bond money will purchase the lion's share of the mountain while, uh, uh, let's see, sorry, I got, um, okay. So, uh, so while 800,000 will come from private funding. So the lion's share will be done through the open space bond money. And the open space bond money is a continuation of people wanting to buy open space for public use. So they, part of the background of this, if you haven't already heard about Marshall Mountain, it was a privately owned operation. Then it, like it was a family run uh, ski resort. I knew the family. 
Then there was a transitional period where they kind of jumped between different things. And you know, it's a ski resort. And the problem with the, this particular ski resort is that it doesn't have as much snow as they, uh, as other ski areas, which was a detriment to them. But as the city of Missoula was starting to rent the site for some time, they, they, they determined that, oh, hey, you know, we used it in the summer. We have a lot of great programs from this. There's great hiking spots. This isn't just something that we can just uh, bank on in terms of just winter recreation. Maybe we should try looking at this. And so they're, they put it out there and looks like this is a, a feasible option for uh, the open space bond money to go towards. A lot of people are interested. Uh, they do plan to raise some money to help uh, privately, publicly fund this moving forward. So um, that's kind of what's happening there. Um, this week, the mayor and many local government officials are, are talking about the urban camping in Missoula. It seems like they do. We're kind of doing like a presser this week. Also, they did the uh, Wednesdays with the mayor, in which I'll talk about later during my city council report. Mayor Jordan Hess has spoken Wednesday afternoon and evening for addressing many folks' is concerned about the emergency winter shelter closure and the subsequent people who had to leave. Many of the pitfalls these folks come across, rather than not being wanted, is mental health, addiction, strong feelings against homeless services, but most of all lack the safety nets that seem to catch folks who can't keep punching the couch surfing card any longer. On top of that, the police and government are more limited because you can't simply remove people from public spaces when they're not doing anything at all. So it's the concept of like, oh, I see them there. I don't really like them being there, but you can't do anything because they're not, they're just standing there. They're not doing anything. So that's kind of what a lot of these laws protect people from. It's like you can't arrest people for not doing anything. So. That's, that kind of comes about from not being allowed to arrest anyone for public intoxication. But if they are not doing anything at all, how can you, how can you can call it illegal? So I, I just kind of wanted to go on that little rant just so you guys know what some of the difficulties that the police are having with handling some of these situations when they're not actually uh, determined as those kind of situations which would involve police, like if they're erratic or their behavior uh, disorderly conduct, that kind of thing. But a lot of them are just kind of standing around, maybe smoking a cigarette and just talking. That's literally what it is. And so, you know, that's just kind of how it is. You know, the whole, uh, I have a whole segment devoted to the urban camping. Um, Wednesdays with the mayor. I have some clips I'm going to show you guys later in the show for my city council report. City council didn't happen this week, so I'm going to have a, a little bit shorter of that report. So um, I also want to promote another show that I've been doing on MCAT. It's called Music in Missoula with Gary Gillette. And here's a little taste of uh, some of our past episode, and you can watch it now. Right now, it's from the uh, Garden City Strings. She was playing along by by ear. I could tell she was just playing by ear the folk mm -hmm. tunes that yes. were being sung, yeah. and I'm just so jealous of that because yeah. you know I, I don't I don't play I by ear either. with a hoot because someone gave us an instrument and a fingering chart and said, okay, now learn how to read. And I yeah. can I can play it if it's written, but I'm jealous of those I folks that, that yeah. can just play, especially folk tunes. Mm -hmm. Hey, welcome back, kids. I'm Gary Gillette, and this is Music in Missoula. And uh, today we've got members of the Garden City Strings. It's a string, a musical string group here in, in uh, Missoula. And some of the folks have stayed around after their performance, which will be uh, part of this presentation. I bet. I bet they'll, they'll, he'll interrupt our little chat, and there'll be some music, and then he'll do that back and forth. But that way you get to know the folks in the group a little bit, if I can shut up long enough to find out who they are. <laughs> Hey, will you please introduce yourself and we'll come right around and we'll find some stories. Sure. Sally McHugh Rappold and I play violin. Donna Williams violin. Uh, Beth Mashevsky and I play second violin in the group. 
That's not a very Irish name. And I'm Audrey no. Peterson, and I also play violin. Oh man, I'm surrounded by violinists. Yes, That's okay. Are. That's okay. I uh, I had a wonderful uh, uh, undergraduate education, and uh, uh, I, I, part of it was two years of uh, violin. Hmm. And uh, got back in back in the Midwest, that uh, instrumental teachers were trained. Uh, so you were a band director and the orchestra director mm -hmm. in your schools. Not not that way out west. So I had a solid education. I taught strings for a while at Big Sky, maybe six years or something like that. So I, I have an affinity, and I know uh, how hard it is to play a tune with a beautiful sound, especially on violin. Oh, my gosh, it's so hard. So much easier to uh, to sound more beautiful on cello and, uh, yeah. and, and bass. Oh, my gosh. And I raised, uh, the best thing I did was I raised a cellist. And uh, he's just a monster player, my boy. And he turned about 18. He turned the cello on its side and started playing metal guitar. But it's okay because he's a he's a great musician uh, and used all that all the all that technique. Uh, it was amazing how he just took the technique and brought it to here. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, the yeah. first time I heard him play, I couldn't believe it. Hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? What you do? Um, I grew up in Missoula and went through what was Roosevelt grade school, Hellgate High School, and my parents were from Butte, America. So I'm a native Montanan, oh. left for 25 years, and I didn't play much violin. I played in college and a little bit beyond college um, in different parts of the country, New England and then Houston. And then I didn't play for a while. I raised four children. I was a Navy nurse and lived on the East Coast, up and down the East Coast, Philadelphia, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and then San Diego, and then moved back here. Sounds like a military family. Yes. Huh? And moved back. Hey guys, welcome back. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, regardless of music in Missoula, um, Gary Gillette also uh, is the director of the City Band, and so the City Band will be coming back in June. Their first performance um, is the 21st, but they do have a big band, a smaller section from the City Band group that's going to be a week before as they kick off into the City Band concert series, which will be June 14th, which is more than a month and a half away. I also wanted to mention is that the Farmer's Market is going to be going into full gear exactly one week from tomorrow, and so there's a little bit of information on that. So before I get into events, I'll get to talk about some movies that are coming out this uh, weekend as well. Uh, we're going to kick things off with his, um, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Basically, a city girl moves to a small town and learns how to become an adult in a world about the Jesuses. Enjoy tropes from Hicks saying, you don't belong here, to the one edgy teenager who makes uh, her uh, taste her first beer and fall in love with the wrong boy or girl. It might be updated for modern audiences. But if you liked being 17, then you will probably like a story about a teenage girl being insufferable for reasons beyond understanding because teenage girls are the most dangerous things ever. Um, based on a book from the 70s about spiritual soul searching. Um, then we got a sports movie about Big George Foreman. Uh, you remember the guy who made the grill that cooks the fat out? Well, here's his sports biopic. Perhaps we'll see his reason for naming all his, cores, uh, all his kids George Foreman and Georgia Foreman, but we'll most likely get the alley fight, rumble in the jungle, but we'll have, he'll have to think about his whole life before he takes on the punches, that kind of like artsy stuff. You know, it's kind of like uh, Ali's last wins as heavyweight and uh, never go, uh, got to fight him again. So, you know, George Foreman only got one really big fight with him. Um, this was towards the end of Ali's career. But, you know, it, it kind of like he was kind of squished between um, um, Muhammad Ali and, of course, uh, Mike Tyson uh, in those careers. And anyways, watch this rise and end of, the, of his boxing career in this biopic that kind of showed up uh, showed us the man behind my dad's and anyone over 45's cooking grills. It's kind of like a very cheap panini press. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm selling his thing. Um, wait, hold on a second. 
Okay, so Black Demon, turn off your brain and watch yet another shark movie based on a true story about a shark attack. But of course, you know, Hollywood, they're going to take some leniency to make it a little. So anyways, usually a shark movies, we're stuck with a ragtag group of outcasts away uh, with no escape scenario. And then you add a shark for a good measure and perhaps a rich capitalist and you're cooking with sushi. Um, while, so this movie is basically follows a family that goes to Mexico. What could go wrong? Uh, because everyone knows when you have a seemingly innocent trip to Mexico, all muerto breaks loose. And finally, this isn't a movie. This is a video game. Um, this is from a very popular uh, kind of a Souls, Dark Souls, Metrovania. Basically, all the best things about video games kind of thrown into be like, hey, what if we, you know, you know how we like the like, you know, Elder Scrolls, but what if we use those same mechanics and put them into Star Wars, but then also add Star Wars mechanics, and then everyone loves it, and they did. This is the sequel. It's called Jedi Survivor. Uh, everyone seemed to like the Dark Souls, but Star Wars approached us so much that they decided to make another one. Play as a Jedi at the height of the Empire as he and his friends of a colorful group of characters fight to survive and fight against another colorful cast of characters from empire goons to mercenaries to monsters to battle droids and all of them Star Wars doing the Star Wars thing while you, you mar your way through the levels. And I'm pretty sure this is, uh, uh, you know, pits the Jedi guy against the odds while getting new abilities to make this Dark Souls Metrovania type game busy with a bunch of BS side quests to get what poncho people are always looking for. And that poncho thing is for people who actually play the game like myself. So I might get it when it's on sale. I don't know if I want to get it now. I'm still waiting for the uh, Tears of the Kingdom from Zelda. All right, so those are the uh, movies that are coming out this weekend. Here's a movie from the uh, Heroes for Sale 1933. And uh, this is what I read dubbed for your viewing pleasure. So this is dubbing stuff. Uh, sir, sir, that's a window, mm. sir. Mm? Please stare, stop staring off that window. It's weird. Yeah. Oh, I have to really warn you about this one gal. She's very, very clingy. Oh, no need to worry about me, ma'am. I'm very intolerable. Oh, there she is, Vanessa. I heard a man's voice, and I was like, what the heck? Ooh, he's kind of cute. I want some of that. Uh, hi, my name is Clark. Uh, your name is uh, Vanessa. Nice to meet you. I was just going to uh, rent the room for the night. Well, I'll be on my way now. Here's your two dollars. Thank you. Ooh, money. Uh, so you like Hoopa's Tank? Oh, God, that's stupid. You're throwing off my game. <laughs> I don't know what game you're talking about. Perhaps when I'm doing some cleaning, I can find your uh, game. No, I don't need clean towels, thank well, you. Well, be careful of Vanessa, okay? Well, my name is Vanessa Cartwright. Well, my name is Clark Ableton, uh, salesman. Zoom! Uh, we just don't get no traveling salesmen around here. I'm just an innocent girl. I'm not honeypotting you. While you check yourself in the mirror, I'm going to close this window. Oh, God. Ah, darn it. All right. Yep. Oh, Jeez. You got to latch it first. All right, stand aside. Let me show you some muscle. See? Throw it down, wrap it around here, and there you go. That easy like that. Wow, you sure are handy. You must have been living here for quite some time with all these kind of uh, fancy windows. Oh, think nothing of it. I've just been living here way too long. Well, I could use someone like you on my team. You know... Oh, you mean like baseball? Well, not exactly. Um. Well, out with it now. Well, I'm just a tourist. Perhaps you can give me a... An apple? Would you like an apple? Well, not quite an apple. Will you just ask her out already? You've been standing there all night. Okay, he's right. Um, how would you like to just... Well, he's know... not always right. He doesn't believe in gravity, and he doesn't believe in the moon. The moon? Are you serious? Oh, well, he just says it's the flip side of the sun. <laughs> He's really stupid. Oh, the circus is in town. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can go to the circus if you want to. Can I get a candy apple? Sure, but after dinner. Uh, okay, that sounds really good. Where do you want to eat? Oh, I was thinking about the restaurant downstairs. All right, wait a minute, you two. Well, what is it? I totally forgot why I walked out here. Were you the guy who was yelling at us? Uh, no, that was, uh, some total loser. I'll, I'll, I'll show my whip self out. Huh. Well, that was kind of weird. Well, that's Dr. Von Braun. Oh, Dr. Von Braun, the eccentric scientist. One out of ten is good success. One out of ten doesn't seem like a good scientist, after all. Our date's gonna be a ten out of ten. Even without Hoopa Stank? Mm, maybe like nine out of ten. Let's not get into the details of this particular date. Let's just do it. Uh, nine out of ten. And if we are out late enough, maybe we could get tacos after we get drinks. <laughs> you really know how to put the stank at Hoopa Stank.
<laughs> Whoops, welcome back. Let's talk about some things that are happening within the city of Missoula. It's the urban camping and there's some uh, folks on the city uh, that talk a little bit more about this. So um, Mayor Hess addresses some of the issues that are going on in the city of Missoula and this is what he had to say. You know, we've, we're a caring community. We've historically had a compassionate response to those experiencing homelessness in our community. And um, we continue to have that. But what we have right now is um, people um, without homes in our community who are living unsheltered in tents or vehicles, um, camping where they're not welcome because they have no other alternatives. And so that's the base problem that we are, or the base scenario that we're dealing with. Um, it doesn't mean that our, um, our reactions around uh, compassion and, and providing services have changed. What it does mean is that we have a scale and scope of problem that is beyond our ability to uh, address with existing, uh, with, uh, to adequately address with existing resources. And the thing you mentioned, Peter, that I think is a great point is that um, we are, uh, in, the, in, the, in the western U.S., um, we've seen escalated housing prices, we've seen, um, we've seen a large increase in the number of people living unsheltered, not just in Missoula, but around the west. We've seen that um, in cities throughout Montana, uh, in, you know, in the Flathead. We've, we've seen it um, in uh, other communities around Montana and around the West. And w there's a couple of common through lines. One of those is um, our escalated housing prices and um, just the, the challenges, the real challenges that that is causing for, uh, for people on the ground. Another is uh, increase of um, addiction and mental health issues and um, untreated uh, crisis. You know, and a lot of times you, you don't want to, th and, and just as a reaction to that too, uh, just uh, um, the Ninth Circuit uh, court ruled that folks cannot be removed from public spaces only if they have encroached on private property or disorderly contact. Loitering ain't a crime, sorry. Uh, police tools are limited to forcibly removing people and how this meeting uh, brought in police officer Captain Stone Saffer to talk about their efforts and just trying to get, in, get this people uh, um, the help that they need. I would say it's difficult to render an opinion on this exact situation, right, because I wasn't there and I didn't have an opportunity to see it. I, I, I don't doubt it. And my officers respond to probably dozens of calls similar to that every day. And because we're in a new operational environment with new restrictions and some of our traditional tools have been rendered, I guess, not usable in this, in this current environment with a lot of what is continuing to evolve, each of these situations have to be looked at individually and the rights of all of the citizens of Missoula have to be weighed in each of these situations. The courts have clearly signaled that people have a right to be present and be unhoused, and we also have a right to have public right-of-ways be passable and general health and safety concerns be addressed. And so, once again, my officers respond again and again to calls like that, and each one is its own new experience because we are sort of trying to figure out the best way to balance all of these concerns at the same time. I would encourage people to continue calling in cases where health, safety, and right-of-way access are a concern. We will respond. Okay. And so that was the uh, the police response to urban camping and the increased homeless uh, uh, coming into the downtown area. Um, one of the uh, things that he was referring to is some of the questions that were brought up during the public uh, Q&A was that, you know, there was somebody who was on the street who was passed out and they had to walk around them, you know, the smell of booze, the th kind of things like that, that made them generally uncomfortable. There's really not much a lot of the city and nor the police and any kind of uh, official body can really do about that. And that's just the unfortunate nature of things. And one of the misconceptions that they also wanted to bring in to the fact is that people don't move to Missoula to become homeless. People move to Missoula and then something happens and then they become homeless after the fact. And then there's uh, other situations in which, you know, some people brought up the fact that, oh, people are being busted in other, uh, from other towns and stuff like that. People who move to Missoula from other smaller towns in the, uh, the state of Montana are only coming to Missoula because of the services that are provided for folks to try to get into housing rather than the communities that they actually live in. And so many, many times, like Jordan and um, Hess, the mayor, um, Josh Slotnick also speaks during this as well, uh, county commissioner. He also refers to uh, state government, you know, the tax reform, you know, how can, uh, you know, like, in, uh, not to mention the levy that didn't pass that 
involved, you know, the citizens of Missoula being like, hey, we want to fund this, uh, the emergency winter for shelter, Operation Shelter to continue these services past uh, the ARPA funding, which is basically up after this year. So a lot of the situation is just like all the services that were really being pumped in this is now just poof kind of gone and so we got actually got the uh, director of uh, the executive director of the Pavarello homeless shelter which is pretty much the one-stop shop for a lot of people in Missoula tr uh, struggling with homelessness and uh, this is what uh, she had to say this is uh, Jill Bonney um, at the emergency winter shelter this season like the mayor was explaining there was over a hundred individuals uh, most nights and we you know our maximum Sleeping was 167, that's a lot of people. 123 people stayed on Christmas night. We were glad we were open. And it got really cold this winter several times and it was a really long winter. But on April 10th, when it closed, um, it's understandable that urban camping increased because when we were still seeing 80 plus people at the emergency winter shelter, they had to have some place to go. And there's not a lot of options, I think, you know, between Temporary Safe Outdoor Space and the Pavarello Center were, were options, but we don't have enough room. And um, there are hundreds of people that need a place to go. And also from the Missoula, uh, Missoulian, uh, I mean, Missoula Current article that uh, came out for the, from the Wednesday uh, press release is that they, they refer to a lot of this as well. Um, let's see. Um, who else? Oh, oh, right. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot more to this. You know, I know someone who's on the street and there's very little that he can do but wait for, you know, the apartments or being able to stay inside the pub since it is at capacity and he's been turned away. And he says that it's like a lottery system and they pick whoever, you know, gets the chance to get to stay in the pub and then eventually get into better housing after the fact. Because it does, it take, there's a process. It takes some time. Even renters are having trouble finding places to rent too. And unless you have something kind of lined up or you're on a waiting list, you can't just... Uh, jump ship and just move out within a month like you need to have a lo lo lot longer plan just to find a rental like you know many people f go a uh, year plus just trying to look for a house you know for rentals it's usually used to be so easy in the city of Missoula but now since there's such a huge competition it's not necessarily the fault of people um, moving to Missoula to be homeless it's the the people who are moving to Missoula taking up all the housing and then the people who are trying and struggling already dealing with higher prices inflation you know higher rents and stuff like that you know like like there was an anti-eviction moratorium that uh, Governor Bullock uh, put into place uh, along with you know the federal and just trying to uh, work with uh, trying to you know during the pandemic you know you can't just evict people because they can't even go out to work and pay the rent so and then you know there was it, it's an interesting uh, thing kind of going on forward and you know um, yeah I mean it's it's a perpetual cycle for a lot of folks who just uh, make just about just the right amount of money just so they can stay in a place. And then, you know, one thing after, after another, just things happen and stuff like that. And there's, you know, there, there aren't that many options. You know, Hope Rescue Mission is one of the options here in, in town as well. But even they are somewhat limited. Um, they're the ones that helped create those temporary safe outdoor spaces during the pandemic to kind of really help people who are struggling, not to mention help uh, mitigate the use of um, those kind of camps that were on the Reserve Street River. Um, the Re Reserve Street Bridge next to the river, that was one of the main reasons where they wanted to move all of them over to the other side of town. Didn't necessarily work, and so, you know, sorry, I'm giving you way too much context, but I just wanted to let you guys know that was a lot of it um, moving forward. And so Hope Rescue Mission Director Jim Hicks talks about the struggle of some of the folks and some of his examples. When I see someone on the street, it has shifted to what happened to you. Because everyone has a story of where they came from and what they're doing and how they're dealing with life. And it is, uh, it is a challenge to, to walk with them, but it's also a pleasure to look them in the eye and give them some dignity, helping them to move forward. And that's, that's what we're about. We've uh, moved because of our great Partners at the county at United Way uh, moved the temporary safe outdoor space to hard-sided shelters. Uh, part of the reason for that is helping people learn how to live inside, how to maintain some property. Uh, they've, they've been away for that maybe from years. Uh, we've had uh, 
people have lived under the bridge, one for nine years. So they, they weren't imported at that point. They were Missoulians and others for 12 years through the winter. And so we're just trying to take, uh, from our end, take those that are, are ready to move forward, help them to move forward. This is what we need to do. I'll, I'll, I'll not forget a lady that came back to our office just bawling, saying this is the hardest, best thing I've ever done. Her story was she got mail. Well, she didn't know what to do with that mail. There was all kinds of stuff. She, she, it was just overwhelming to her, so she started throwing it all away, uh, which meant it led to a possible eviction. And we had to come in and work with a landlord, work with her, help her get a budget, learn how, learn how to operate. So the, the, the thing I want you to catch is every story is different, and we have an incredible community, some incredible partners that are working as hard as we can to do the part that we can do. Okay, and that was Jim Hicks uh, with the uh, Hope Rescue Mission. Uh, let's go back to my notes. Um, another thing to think about is that somebody, uh, some people, stress can be debilitating. Veterans, for example, are taken care of and told when and what to do, and then they get out of the service, and some of them only joined because they didn't know what else to do after high school. Think about it as pushing the snooze button on getting your life together. Jim Hicks also went into a story about uh, covering addicts and the support they needed to kick the habit and stay clean. Many, uh, maybe homelessness isn't so much of a hidden issue anymore because there's people who couch surf and stay with friends or family, but some of these people don't have the support systems in place. Um, and when they falter, they end up becoming homeless. J uh, Jill Bonney talks about the hot teams. And so, you know, while there's many places like the POV, we're just like, hey, meet us halfway, don't do drugs, stay with our schedule, and you will promise you you can get into housing. Um, I'm sorry, but you can't have your dog. You know, it, 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 you know, there's just a lot of barriers that a lot of people have to get over because, you know, there's some places that are just like, oh, sorry, this place doesn't allow dogs, and then the person is like, I'm going to stay homeless because I love my dog. There's one instance where that actually was said during one of the city council meetings, and I showed it to you guys a couple weeks ago. Um, so uh, Jill Bonney talks a little bit more about the hot teams and how you know it's not just about meeting people halfway. Sometimes you gotta go the extra mile, and you know some of these people, they never had people go the extra mile for them, family included. The majority of the people that are on the homeless outreach team started out working direct care at the Poverty Center. So, what direct care means is that they're working at the front desk and really working with the people that we serve all of the time. And I think that that has really given them a good training and understanding. And then what they do when they um, are on the team and go out in the community is they not only work with the individuals that are living unsheltered and try to you know, build trust and rapport and help connect them to resources, but they also work with business owners and try to respond if someone has a concern about how do I handle this situation Try to talk to them about the causes of homelessness and really um, why people may be experiencing homelessness and you know just really does that whole connection we have people that came to the emergency winter shelter the last couple of years that had not come into shelter for years because they didn't trust anyone and the homeless outreach team um, did wonders for that and and we're just proud to have them. And, you know, take it from many cases of some folks who uh, isolate themselves. You know, isolation has been bad for a lot of uh, Americans during these uh, hard pandemic times as we're slowly getting out of it. And just imagine it, what it's like for a lot of homeless people who uh, in many ways kind of uh, isolate themselves and maybe they have to deal with other people that may have stolen from them, took in their drugs, you know, little things like that and just kind of uh, just gave up and are good at basically giving up on certain things to a point where it's just like they need a real big push to get to that kind of stable housing that they've been lacking for so many years. You know, hot teams mean homeless folks where they are, unlike, you know, the POV, which you know, comes on down and meet us halfway. The rest of the meeting went into tax reform and some of the uh, issues with money. And you know, that's what it always comes down to. It's like, you know, we wanna uh, care, we wanna care for these people, but it's gonna cost money. And m you know, Missoula did vote against that uh, continuation of the operation shelter and they uh, mentioned that as well. They also mentioned the, the, the tax reform code and stuff like that and being like, 
there's really not much uh, you know the city of Missoula can do. Our property taxes are already so high just to keep up with the services in place. One of the things that even Josh Slotnick, who's been harping on this for many times, is that we have a, a community, county, city, combined total of 120,000 people. But with the amount of tourism, 3.5 million people at any given time throughout the year, um, they basically quantified and estimated there's an additional 40,000 people visiting at any given time who are taking advantage of the services. So imagine if you break that up, it's like um, we have enough uh, fire, police to handle 120,000 people, and then we have the additional 40,000 people who are visiting who may call upon those services. So anyways, no solutions, just more talking. But I, you know, I did message my local government and chamber of commerce to look into the idea of maybe expanding the idea of the tourism business improvement district. Maybe they could um, implement a homeless additional fee that charge uh, tourists coming into Missoula as a way to fund services rely without relying on the taxpayers. So I mentioned that to them. You know, I haven't heard back from them because I just literally just sent it the other day, like uh, Wednesday night. So. Um, you know, my idea would essentially be like, hey, if there's any organizations here in town that want to opt in to be like, you know, when you go to a grocery store, it says, hey, hey, do you want to donate a dollar to the Ronald McDonald House? It's like, nah. And then, you know, think about it, all those additional people and think about people who just want to give a dollar every shopping venture, maybe every night that they stay at a hotel. And, and it adds up. So it, even it, it, those 3.5 million people, even if they spent one dollar towards, hap, you know, combating local homelessness, essentially that would be $3.5 million going towards helping homelessness. So that kind of makes a lot of sense. Sorry, I'm coming with solutions and I just kind of sent it out. Hopefully it'll go out. Hey, it's, a, it's an interesting idea and you know, we don't have to make people do it. And a lot of times, you know, taxes don't have to be uh, 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 you know, based on what the voters think, but a regional group of people would be like, hey, I want to do this because I think it's right. And perhaps maybe an expansion on this kind of charitable endeavor could entice some people to be like, hey, wait, I donated X amount of money uh, to this cause, and then maybe we can give them tools to also use this as a way to uh, get some tax uh, burden relief as well. Because, you know, when you donate to charity, you have the ability to do some tax relief, and maybe there's a way for people. I just think that there should be a better, better funnel source for people who want to do the right thing to continue to do the right thing rather than relying on democracy to put a strain on a, minor, a mi minority or a majority of people who are really feeling the crunch on these low economic times. So uh, those are, that's, my, uh, uh, that's my stint of my city council report and um, some of the solutions that I think might be helpful. Um, up next, I'm going to show you a, a short video um, from the uh, Helena, oh, hold, hold on a second, I got to retime that. And so this one is, um, hold on, let me look this up. It's The Last Best Constitution. I've been obsessed with this show. This is from the uh, Helena Civic Access Center. It is being highlighted in conjunction with Montana's 50th year of celebrating our Constitution. Here's a clip from the uh, latest episode with Rick Applegate with host Evan Barrett. They, it was a non nonpartisan kind of an approach. And when, uh, when you say it, which used to be in the U.S. Senate, it's worth noting for the, our yeah. viewers that that was the much more collegial uh, U.S. Senate, the, the uh, uh, biggest, uh, the best uh, club in the world, they would say, because, and they all at that time worked together, which is not something we see today. So for, you, for the folks that are viewing, you need to know that, that the Senate you're speaking of was different. But, in, but when they sat alphabetically here in Montana, it made a big difference, according to everyone. It did. Uh, it did. And, uh, I consider it a model. Uh, when I did work in the Senate a little later, we worked Democrats and Republicans every day, every day. Mm -hmm. it was, it was, there were debates. There were differences of opinion. There were votes that were very close, and, and there were contentious issues. But by and large, there was an honest effort uh, beyond the personal level, mm -hmm. which was also there, uh, in, in, in public life to work uh, together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it wasn't that people were just compromising because it was easy. They were collaborating because it was hard, and mm -hmm. the issues were hard. And they're harder now, and you're right, it's night and day from what I saw in the U.S. Senate and what I observe now. And, uh, and in Montana, we, we had a situation where the folks were not elected officials. Right. And so, uh, and it, the alphabetical seating 
uh, okay. it, it produced a, 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 a kind of a collegial thing there here okay. that was actually genuine yep. and all the delegates to this day speak that uh, that was a powerful force and influence for them to be able to work together. Yeah, to this day right. I have. So that's a little tease of this. You guys are more than welcome to uh, check out Last Best Constitution. It is on MCAT's YouTube page. We're also airing it on our channel 189. You can check our local listings at MCAT.org. All right, so um, we're going to jump right into some events that are going on this week. Um, I'm wrapping up my show. MCAT is going to uh, film this upcoming event. This is uh, the Missoula Pro AM and forestry days enjoy a series of college students chopping wood and various feats of skill and strength as they climb logs and log roll their way into prestige in this annual event hosted by the University of Montana's forestry de department. Go to the fort and listen closely to the chopping and sounds of chainsaws, but if you want specifics, go to the uh, southern corner near the main building of the Historical Museum and you can't miss it. Uh, makerspace walk-in hours, 3D print, laser engravers, and many other hands-on do-it-yourself projects um, over the Makerspace. They have their open hours on Fridays at starting at 9.30 a.m. Story time and tiny tales at 10.30 a.m. every Friday. It is a great opportunity for kids to learn to read. Um, <laughs> I didn't know why I said it so aggressively at the end, but um, also the food bank is open um, um, at 10.30. They go about 10 o'clock. They open till about one o'clock um, every Friday. It's a good way for people to source locally cheap food. Uh, lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. Uh, Missoula Senior Center, these are also cheap lunch, lunches geared towards seniors, but welcome for community space geared towards senior living and encourage citizens to participate in many of their events hosted in this space. They also have a great thrift store in their basement. Yarns and watercolor at the library back again at 12 to f uh, 1 p.m. Um, also wanted to mention that usually watercolor starts wrapping up in the summer. Um, yarns usually consistently there. It's all on the fourth floor of the public library. It's every single week at noon. Hands-on science, geology, and fossils. Um, the Spectrum Discovery Center hosts a series of science activities. This one's specifically going to be geared, geared towards geology and fossils. Mm, excuse me. <laughs> Learning with Meaning, Spring Open House. Hey, are you tired of the uh, uh, education, the public education school system? Well, this is kind of like, I like to call this an educational co-op. For a lot of parents who like to homeschool their kids but still want them to get used to other kids and just kind of socialize them, it is a, uh, the Learning with Meaning is an organization that does that. And they have an open house uh, starting today at 4 p.m. until about 5.30. John Rafito, Stand Up Startup challenge, not stand up. This is a startup. So if you're business minded, University of Montana 32 Campus Drive, which is basically kind of east of the football stadium towards the M, kind of a weird place to have this. But this is a startup challenge where you where you can get up to fifty thousand dollars in grants awarded to four finalists. And basically, these are for new business and or social entrepreneur ventures ideas for a, a adjudication. So this is pretty great stuff. This is a startup challenge challenge run by the UM College of Business. So. Check it out. Uh, pottery date night. So if you're interested in doing a date night, Clay Studio Missoula does a date night called Pottery Date Night. D&D um, &D Guild for Adults. So library hosts an online D&D &D for adults. It's very, by our very own um, Brian. Uh, for history buffs through the time, Missoula uh, Public Library is hosting a uh, paleontologist, Kelly Moore, gives his quiz history of the evolution of life on Earth. They'll start with the first evidence of life around 4 billion years ago and work our way up to the most recent ice age that ends about 12,000 years ago. This program is for history buffs presentation as well as part of the Fossils Rock Lecture Series. Josh Farmer is playing at the Cranky Sam Public House tonight at 7 p.m. He's a great musician, pianist, uh, went to college with him. Great guy. Uh, Jeff Dunham headlines the Adam Center. So if you want a big event starting at 7 p.m. Adam Center, uh, Jeff Dunham is going to be visiting Missoula to do some stand-up. Aaron Goley and the original Sin uh, rock rap indie leaning venue over at the Monk's Bar, Monk's Tavern. UM Percussion Ensemble World with Rhythms Concert, Denison Theater. This is one of their best concerts that they usually do year round when it's not the uh, Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival and also the Fusions concert, which is just a lot of the arts department with the dance department coming together. But World Rhythms is all about them drums and it's really great. They have steel drums, it's, it's amazing. Uh, John Floridas and Jennifer Slayton at the Old Post. They're gonna be playing some acoustic kind of music, chill. Um, Copper uh, Mountain Band is going to play some country music at the Sunrise Saloon. Cash River Junkers will also be playing there uh, at 9 p.m. So, oh, actually, no, no. Cash River Junkers is at Union Club. My bad. Uh, Saturday, like I said, we're getting close to the farmer's market. So if you are interested in doing, still doing the winter's market um, from 9 to 1 p.m. at the Orchard Homes and Southgate Mall, they're going to be doing that for this weekend. They might be doing it a little bit longer. Who knows? But 
The farmer's market will kick off on May 7th, which is going to be a week from tomorrow. So uh, farmer's market is an amazing event, by the way. It's great. A lot of uh, locally sourced food. First couple weeks are kind of rough because it's like, you know, there's not really things that are, there's not many things that have been grown up until that point. But then as we get into the summer, it's the huckleberry season, and then it's going to be crazy, crazy. So the 51st annual YMCA Riverbank Run, hosted by the YMCA. Race training, 51th annual Riverbank runs to its downtown roots on uh, Saturday, April 29th, and resignation is now uh, open um, for four, uh, with four race options, one mile, 5K, 10K, and earn bragging rights by running all three in the signature event, the Trifecta, and you can go to riverbankrun.org for more information. Tech Connect, if you're tech literate, Tech Connect is the best place to do it. They don't do this every Saturday, but they do this a lot of Saturdays here at the Missoula Public Library. Bring in the device that doesn't work, if you have any problems with that, they do it on the third floor in the Blackfoot Room. Bring your devices. Uh, bake sale for Indigenous Women's uh, Rising. Betty's Divine, they're doing a bake sale from 11 to 2-ish uh, or until they sell out at Betty's Divine. All proceeds go to Indigenous Women Rising Abortion Fund. The second annual Spring Fling uh, in the Old Sawmill District. Multiple local vendors will be selling their plants, food, and homemade crafts in a pop-up farmer's market that's Old Sawmill District. I guess some people are getting a little bit uh, antsy to get the farmer's market started, so they're going to be doing this at the Old Sawmill District. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to look up more information. It's uh, most of the beautiful weekend by shopping or simply taking blah, 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 blah. Uh, semantics, semantics. So, yeah, it's a farmer's market at the Old Sawmill District. I believe that's off of uh, Wyoming Street just as you're turning past the uh, McCormick um, just past Current Aquatic Center. So, MCAT's Saturday drop-ins. Uh, MCAT hosts a Saturday drop-in every Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. It's a, a great activity for, uh, it's like a workshop. It's a great way for kids to come in with their, own, with their own stuff, work on their own projects. But most of all, we gear towards uh, stop animation. If kids want to come here, learn some video editing, voice recordings, and that kind of stuff. This is a great introduction for a lot of kids just to get their hands uh, dirty with that kind of stuff. Uh, Shotgun Social. Deer Creek Shooting Range, a shotgun social at Deer Creek Shooting Range. What the heck's going on here? This is an opportunity to get some practice in with your gun and meet other like-minded individuals. This event will teach the basics of firearm safety only and focus on acquiring your targets. Uh, clays will be provided. Attendees will need to bring their own guns and ammo. Ear protection and safety glasses are required. Rolled Dolls, Matilda the Musical is going to be playing this weekend. And if you want to, if you want to know what that's all about, this is the uh, from the book Matilda. Uh, which was made into that movie with Danny DeVito, but then they made another movie, which was a musical with uh, Emma Thomas, who is Ms. Trunchbull. So with the popularity of the movie popping in on Netflix, Missoula Community Theater is hosting a musical for audience of all ages. Young Matilda is a new grown school and has to do with the wicked and vile headmaster Trunchbull. The gifted child user is smart in a little bit of telekinesis to save the school of tyranny. The, school, the show will go on throughout the weekend. All matinees are on the weekend at 2 p.m., all evening shows at 7.30 p.m. except for Sundays, which have an early evening show at 6.30 p.m. Um, I'm an MCT guy. I love MCT. I, I haven't been to a show in a while. Maybe I'll go check it out. Roll and read to encourage people to get out and about, but also read. McCormick Park is hosting an event starting at 2 p.m. on Saturday. Bring your strollers and comfy shoes to join Missoula's uh, second annual Roll and Read for zero to five-year-olds. Families are welcome to come to this free event stroll from one station to another to hear stories read by firefighters, a compost collector, and other exciting characters. After hearing stories, you can have a snack and check out the mountain lion buses, a compost truck, and more, hosted by the Missoula City County Health Department. The Gravy Ladles uh, is going to be playing um, some folk music at Animation Nation Co uh, Brewing Company at 6 p.m. on Saturday. Also 6 p.m. at DraftWorks is going to be a jam band called The Queens and Mr. G. Circus de Kelic, uh, Circus uh, Cir Kid like, ugh, probably should have uh, looked that up, but uh, they're doing, ooh, I don't even know what that is. Oops, delete, that never happened. Forget this happened, delete. All right, anyways, <laughs> Wild Night for Wildlife. Free Cycles is doing a 15th annual fundraiser for the Night of Wildlife. Your favorite wild game plates, frosty local brews, and outstanding auction items, and Ruffer Advisor will uh, be back like never before this year. They are switching it up the scene in partying down at Free Cycles on Saturday, April 29th. Sarah Frazier is going to do a Modular Haze Night Witch. Is going to be playing some rock music at the, um, um, oh, at Monks. Uh, Blue Collar uh, Band at the Jack Saloon is going to be at the Jack Saloon. Um, country Music Blue Collar Band at Jack Saloon. 
uh, Dueling Pianos with the Dueling Missoulians um, is going to be at 8 p.m. at uh, Stave and Hoop. Live Comedy, Matt Browner is going to be at Westside Theater. Uh, Casey McLean is going to do some comedy at the VFW. Margie Cates is going to be at the Old Post at 8 p.m. on Saturday. Solid State Karaoke is going to be at Westside Lanes and Fun Service starting at 9 p.m. Um, Jackson Holt and the Highway Patrol, 9 p.m. Uh, oh, wow. I did not put the venue down. All right, and that's going to, okay. Cahoots, all country dancing music. Um, Sunrise Saloon is going to be at 9 p.m. DJ Chris Moon is going to do the, uh, the Badlander at 10 p.m., wrapping up your Saturday. So there's a lot of things happening this weekend. Uh, Sunday, uh, they're doing an, uh, the 15th Annual Writing Contest hosted by the Missoula Public Library. This is from 1 to 3 p.m. Celebrate the winners of the 15th Annual Writing Contest. There'll be prizes awarded readings from the winners of each age category, recognition of our sponsors, and tasty treats and beverages. So those are your events this weekend, and I hope you guys do have this wonderful weekend. There's definitely a lot going on in the city of Missoula. We're, things are warming up. Um, I believe there's definitely going to be a couple of brew fests going to be coming up pretty soon. Uh, Karis Park is going to be overused to the point where, uh, uh, you know, there's going to be a brew fest seemingly every single week in the Karis Park uh, going on into the summer. So um, I want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.